Hello everybody, welcome. Welcome at this last session of this year, this last Getting Technical event, and the subject of today is uh, quite an interesting one. What are technological milling strategies? That's, an, that's easy, that's an easy question. But how to select one, how to, to find one that, that gives you the biggest advantage, that's a little bit a more difficult question. And um, of course, I'm not alone here again together with my colleagues, Margarita, Vigio, and Alesia. We bring you this session. Um, and, and perhaps I should use a video to, to illustrate the question we are going to try to answer today. It's, it's very simple. What you see here for the moment is, is a number of milling cutters. It's a number of strategies. And they all try to do the same thing, produce a slot. But I guess you see quite some differences. And, and the question here is about which of these strategies should you select? Which of these strategies is most appropriate for your application? And by the way, this is one of the, the best videos ever I found on, on this subject. But unfortunately, I don't know who produced it. So if any of you can, can help me with that, I would appreciate that you let me know who made this video. I, I, can, I can express my gratitude to that person because this is really a very, very fine way of showing what we are going to talk about today. Because milling today, milling in small batch production, which is this, the, 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 the main situation today, is quite a demanding thing. You, you know, if, 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 people have to come up with a solution for milling. There are very high demands on quality of finished parts, bigger than ever or higher than ever. There are very big demands on, on productivity, uh, cost efficiency. And from a technological perspective, um, the materials we machine are, are more and more classified as difficult to machine materials. The workpiece shapes we want to produce are uh, becoming more complex than ever. And on top of it, the, the, the shape of a workpiece, the dimension of a workpiece uh, makes that we have to, to use tools which are not exactly the most ideal tools. And we have to, to deal with that. So milling today is, is not easy. Uh, there are quite some challenges. And last session, we discussed about milling strategies in general. And we, we define a milling strategy as a, a scenario we have to come up with for one, one single milling application or for a combination of applications that all together finish a workpiece. And a milling strategy, the scenario has to help us to define which cutting tool should we use. How should we cope with the conditions in which we have to, to perform the application? What cutting uh, data do we select for the milling cutter we want to use? The tool part uh, needs to be defined upon. So mi milling in, in general is, or a milling strategy in general, is quite a lot of things to, to define. And a technological milling strategy, which is a subdomain in that vast strategy thinking, a technological milling strategy has to do with the question I brought up last time also. If, if we end up in, in this situation, we need to select a milling cutter, we need to select a tool part, we need to select cutting conditions, we need to, to select cutting data, and there can only be one leading, there can only be one king. And the question then is, who drives the decisions? Is it the CAM software generating tool parts? Is it the tool part that drives which milling cutter we should, we, uh, we should select, uh, the cutting conditions we, we should select? Or do we start from the milling cutter? Do we say, okay, I have a certain milling cutter with certain features? And, 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 and that's my primary choice. That's, that's my priority. And all the other things need to be adapted to maximize the performance of the milling cutter I selected. It's, it's a basic question uh, in, in these discussions. And when, when CAM drives, when, when the tool part drives the decisions, 
Um, then we talk about geometrical strategies. Then we talk about milling uh, applications like ramp milling, helical interpolation milling, cycloidal milling, push-pull profile milling, and so on and so forth. All of these are milling strategies which refer basically to the tool part I selected for the milling cutter and all the other stuff, which milling cutter should I use, the cutting conditions and so on, need to follow. That's the chapter of geometrical strategies. We are not going to talk about that today. Um, then there are some, when we talk about technology, uh, there are several layers here. One layer is what I refer to as the general milling strategies, you know. This is the rather classical, rather traditional thing where we say, okay, I classify my applications related to the result. Uh, I talk about face milling, where, where the, the purpose is to, to produce a face. I talk about slot milling. The purpose there is to produce a slot, square shoulder milling, profile milling, copy milling, and so on and so forth again. This, this is part of technology, but it, it refers more to, to the very, very traditional thing. I have a, a basic application and I select a basic type of milling cutter to do that basic type of application. Technological milling strategies... Uh, and I have to jump a little bit, but I come back in a couple of minutes to this. Technological milling strategies are milling strategies that refer to how am I going to use a milling cutter type I selected in the best possible way when it comes to uh, cutting conditions, cutting data, to maximize the performance of the milling cutter, to realize in the most efficient way my overall economical target. Now that's a long definition. Let me start with the target, economical target. Uh, perhaps you remember some uh, a while ago we had some sessions on economic machining and, and things like that, where we say, okay, if you look machining beyond the technological stuff, to the, the, the target I have, the, the reason why I perform the machining, uh, from an economic perspective, I want to, to be productive, I want to be cost efficient, I want to be sustainable, wh whatever uh, we select there. That's, that's, that's the overall target. To realize that target in the most efficient way, I select equipment. Some of the equipment is not really to be selected. The machine tool is part of the equipment, but that's more or less a given factor. But a cutting tool is, is equipment which can be freely selected. So you select equipment to make sure you reach in the most efficient way your overall target. And the question then is, how am I going to use the selected equipment so that I maximize the possibilities which are laying within the equipment. How am I going to use the tool? How am I going to find cutting conditions when we let that be the driver of all the discussions? That's the moment we talk about truly technological milling strategies. And then we talk about the, the, the famous high, you know, high speed milling, high performance milling, high feed milling, high RPM milling, and so on. That is the main chapter we talk about today, the main subject we talk about today. There are also some milling strategies, and they are classified, because, you know, people like to classify stuff. That, that's how our, our, our brain works. There are strategies which are a bit difficult to classify. That's why we refer to them as the hybrid milling strategies, things like tin wall milling, tin bottom milling, plunge milling, race line milling, all of those things is, is kind of a mixture. It's, it's kind of saying, okay, the, the conditions in which I need to do the application demand for special combinations of tool path tool selection and cutting data selection. It's, it's kind of uh, everything together needs, needs to fit 
to make sure I realize what I want to realize. And, and in the name of these strategies, you already find what you want to realize. I want to produce a tin wall. I want to produce a tin button, and so on. General milling strategies. As I said, the rather classic, traditional way of thinking, I have different type of applications related to the technological results I want to achieve, face milling, slot milling, square shoulder milling, copy milling, and so on. And together with a basic application, I, I come up with a basic tool type, milling cutter type. If, if you look to, to catalogs and, and, and stuff when, when we talk about milling applications, most of the catalogs are, are composed out of chapters a bit like this. You have the face milling cutter range and you have the square shoulder milling cutter range and you have the copy milling cutter ranges and so on. Uh, <clears throat> when, when we are in this domain, here we are confronted with uh, a bit of a basic question which is not so easy to answer and that question is if if you think in terms of pure applications face milling square shoulder milling and so on do you go for uh, application performance tool performance do you want for each of these applications in all the different workpiece materials potentially you want to to machine do you want to have the best performing cutting tool selected, the best performing milling cutter? Do you want to, to think in kind of microeconomic optimizations? I want to have the best face milling cutter. I want next to it having the best square shoulder milling cutter and so on, which gives you the opportunity to optimize application by application. That's the advantage of such an approach. The disadvantage is that after a while you have quite a lot of different types of milling cutters, one for each application. And it's so much optimized for that application, you can't use it for another application anymore. Now, in, in, in today's world, we see very often that, that in, in a workshop, batch sizes are getting smaller and smaller, the so-called small batch production, high mix, low volume production, some people refer to it, where people start to think differently, where people say, okay, all, all that enormous range of different type of milling cutters, that's not what I want to see. I want to have milling cutters, I want to have cutting tools with a broader application domain. I'm looking for a milling cutter that I can use both for face milling and square shoulder milling. That's the versatile approach. And, and in, it's, it's in the, the picture I show here, the vertical axis represents application performance. And you see some examples, the blue peaks you see here are uh, milling cutters which has been selected based on application performance. The horizontal line gives you application area, versatile performance. And there you see with the different colors, I, I try to illustrate, it's a different way of selecting milling cutters. Here you don't go for individual performance based on one application. You go for versatility of a tool selection. You, you look for those tools that gives you the possibility to cover different applications. The advantage here is you have lesser milling cutters, lesser tools, to, to, to have a broader range of applications possible, which is a very interesting approach when you do small batch machining. The disadvantage is, however, if you look application by application, that it's perhaps not the best performing tool possible. But it's the choice you make. And, and it's up to you to, to, to say, okay, I prioritize, again, it's about prioritization, I prioritize or application performance or I prioritize versatility. That's in, in, in this domain a, a basic question to answer. Hybrid milling strategies, here it's, it's rather easy. If you want to produce a tin wall, I, imagine uh, a workpiece material like, like uh, aluminium, soft, Easy, easy deformable, and you need to produce a tin wall. 
by a milling application. Well, here, if you look to classic approaches, you, you have, you have a, a, a problem reaching your, your, your technical target, a tin wall being produced. Because the material will bend and will deform and all kinds of stuff. Here you need an approach which is a combination of a tool part, type of cutting tool, cutting data selection, that gives you technological-wise the opportunity, the possibility to produce a tin wall. Tin wall machining, very similar to it, is so-called tin bottom machining, where the target is to produce tink on, on sheet metal, in which you need to do milling applications. And here it's about, again, finding a correct uh, tool part, uh, correct cutting tool, correct cutting conditions, and all three together must lead to a technical situation that, that delivers a correctly finished workpiece, in this case, a tin bottom. Plunge milling, or also referred to as axial milling, is also a very typical hybrid milling application. It's, it's about here, if you are in situations where stability is, is a limiting factor, you could decide to, to instead of feeding the milling cutter, the, the feed direction using like traditional in, in the radial direction, you could decide to give a feed movement to the milling cutter in axial direction. In the old days, people referred to this as drill milling. In the meantime, we refer to it as plunge milling, axial milling. Why do we call it axial milling? Because the feed is in the actual direction of the milling cutter. Very typical here again, it's, it's a very typical tool part. It's a very typical milling cut, or typical is perhaps, it, it, it gives us an idea, it's a special milling cut. It's not special, it, it, it is a milling cutter which is uh, adapted so you can give it actual feeds. And cutting conditions need to be selected so it's in line with this type of milling cutter and giving it this type of feed. We use this in situations where we lack stability. Uh, race line machining, race line milling, also a called milling with adaptive clearing. Uh, here is a very typical methodology, strategy, where if we are confronted with machine tools which have issues with acceleration, deceleration movements, there where the direction of the feet of a milling cutter changes, uh, where we, we try to find a tool part that gives us the possibility to avoid that the machine tool has to accelerate or decelerate. And if we, if, we, if we prioritize that, if we say th th this tool part needs to be as such that there are as little as possible Brooks movement changes, that we refer to as race line milling, uh, adaptive clearing milling. Um, it's it's uh, a typical hybrid uh, system or hybrid strategy. Now, before we start talking seriously about technological milling strategies, I, I should bring back in, in, in your mind uh, something we talked about at the previous session also, that so-called compensation principle in milling. What do we mean with a compensation principle? And I gave also this example the last time where I say, if, I, if you have a milling cutter with certain features, certain possibilities, and you use that milling cutter in different type of applications, and the two examples I use here to illustrate the principle, to the left is uh, slot milling, to the right is side milling, contour milling. And what we see is that these two applications means that the angle of engagement, the angle over which the milling cutter is in contact with workpiece material, and the cutting edges are actually cutting material, in case of slot milling, I have a big angle of engagement. In case of side milling, contour milling, that angle of engagement is smaller. Now, this leads to a situation, technological, that the temperature in a cutting edge, in a milling application, as cutting edges are cutting, not cutting, cutting, non-cutting, milling is interrupted cutting. 
that we see that the temperature is, while the cutting edge is, is cutting, the temperature in the cutting edge is increasing. Vertical, you see here, temperatures in, in, in the milling cutter edges, maximum temperatures. Horizontally, you see the time factor. The milling cutter is cutting, it's rotating, it's moving to workpiece material. Part of the time, cutting edges are cutting, the temperature rises. Then the cutting edges are on the back side, the temperature goes back. Cutting edges start cutting again, cutting uh, temperatures rise again, decline again, and so on, and so on. In case of big angle of engagement, the temperature rises quite quickly. In case of small angle of engagement, think on side milling, contour milling, I see the same phenomena, but the temperature does not increase so fast. It, it takes kind of a, a longer time before the temperature really starts to be higher. Now, if you know that cutting edges to perform well, the temperature of a cutting edge needs to be in, in the working window, we all feel by sentiment that too high temperatures are, are to be avoided. Because if you heat up a cutting material too much, it loses its ability to cut. It's getting too soft. But also there is a minimum critical temperature. The cutting edges needs to, 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 to have the ability to withstand mechanical impact forces. And for that we need toughness. And toughness in a cutting edge we find by uh, weakening the binder. Or weakening is not the correct word, sorry. I should say softening the binder material. And we do that by, by giving that, that cutting edge a certain temperature. And if, 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 if that temperature is not reached, if the cutting temperature stays below the minimum critical temperature, you will suffer too much, too fast of, of broken cutting edges, shipping on a cutting edge, cracking of cutting edges, and that will limit your tool life. So it's all about having the temperature in between uh, two, two, two values, one could say. And how do we manage that? How do we make sure when uh, uh, angle of engagements are big that the cut cutting temperature does not rise too fast too much? But how do we make also sure that the cutting temperature rises high enough so that the, the, the temperature after a while is within the range it should be? Well, we do that by modifying cutting speeds. Because a cutting speed is, is the, the, the fuel that, that we need in the heat generator, which is machining is, after all. And if you increase your cutting speeds, more heat is generated. And if you reduce your cutting speeds, less heat is generated. And if you combine this, what cutting speed do you use with the angle of engagement you have during the application, you must make that the combination is as such that enough heat is generated to rise the temperature above the minimum critical temperature, but not too much to keep it below the minimum, uh, the maximum critical temperature. And working with that, that is what we refer to as compensation, the compensation principle in milling. And you see here an example where the effective cutting speed you should use during the, the, the actual application is the nominal cutting speed, the cutting speed you find in technical guides and stuff like that, the cutting speed which is determined in a unified situation for the milling cutter. But you have to correct that with a compensation factor. You, you, you see here on the vertical axis in the diagram, the vertical axis gives you the compensation factor. The horizontal axis gives you the radial depth of cut compared to the diameter of a milling cutter, the leading thing that, that determines the angle of, of engagement. And the correction factor, you should use that to correct your unified cutting speed, your nominal cutting speed, to find the, the effective cutting speed, taking into account the cutting engagement angle. The same principle we can use, or we should use, when we talk about depths of cut. The same 
principle we should use to compensate for the thickness of the ships. The feet you want to use, big feet, small feet. The same thinking we can use uh, related to the geometry of a milling cutter because sharper geometries generate less heat. So if you have sharper geometries leading to less heat and you need to, to reach the minimum heat, the minimum temperature to make sure the cutting edge works correctly, you need to increase your cutting speed. And in the end, you end up that the effective cutting speed to be used during machining is the nominal, the unified cutting speed, corrected with a number of correcting factors, taking into account the cutting situation, the cutting condition. Working with this is working with a compensation. Could be Personally, I think this is the most important principle there is in milling. Make sure that, that you compensate in a correct way your cutting conditions so that the, the, the environment in which you use the cutter is, is compensated for. Um, and if you do that, and, and then we end up here finally now with technological milling strategies, what I want to do now with you is give you an overview of the different uh, technological strategies, um, the, the specifications of it, what, what do we mean with it, how do we use a milling cutter, and what is mainly the application domain for it. And I start also here with general milling because general milling is part of this. General milling is that um, yeah, you, you, you select, in general, versatile milling cutters. This is, I, I think this is the basic strategy for small, match, small, small batch uh, applications. You, you select a number of universal, flexible uh, milling cutters, which you use in different type of applications. Uh, face milling, slot milling, square shoulder milling, contour milling, wh whatever applications you have. But you modify, you play a bit with, with the cutting conditions, having in the back of your mind the, the, the yeah, compensation principle. And in general, what we see is that we talk here about average. We use average depths of cut, averages feet, uh, nothing special here. It's referred to as general milling. Uh, then there is a family of milling cutting of uh, uh, technological milling strategies we refer to as advanced roughing. Uh, <coughs> I always have a bit a problem with, with the word advanced, because if there is advanced roughing, then there exists also something like unadvanced roughing, I think. And that, that sounds very strange. Wh whoever wants to use unadvanced roughing strategies, that, that sounds strange. Anyway, advanced roughing strategies, a very typical one is referred to as peel milling. Peel milling is you use a milling cutter with, with the appropriate features to, 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 to be able to do this, with a small radial depth of cut, a large axial depth of cut, and cutting speeds are rather high. It's, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's perhaps a very interesting strategy uh, for 2D milling of, of yeah, workpieces within Z direction, rather big height. Uh, also very typical is this uh, strategy for finishing of walls uh, we use here. Uh, trochoidal milling is a very typical strategy. It's peel milling, but in a slot. Uh, so also here we give a milling cutter a very typical movement, which you see illustrated with the animation in the bottom of the, the slide here, uh, which is called, if you have a circle and if you follow the point on a circle, which is rolling, uh, the, the curve you have then is called a trochoid or a cycloid. It's, it's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, it's a very typical strategy, uh, which is used when a milling cutter is, is within workpiece material, very typical pockets, corners, slots, especially when the workpiece material is considered difficult, mainly hard workpiece materials. This is a very interesting strategy. Uh, it's perhaps not 
the most productive strategy, pr uh, productive defined as uh, time needed to, to end up uh, or to end this, the, the application, but it's a rather cost efficient method. So it's smaller radial depths of cut used when a milling cutter is enclosed by workpiece material, pockets, slots, corners. Uh, we use bigger axial depths of cut, rather big cutting speeds are, are possible because if you use small radial depths of cut, of course, you have the, the, the compensation principle that works here and it gives you the possibility to increase your cutting speeds quite a, a lot. Uh, high speed milling, a very famous one, especially middle of the 90s, I would say. This was very fashionable to talk about high speed milling, high speed machining. Uh, it, it's a, a bit uh, a strategy that came together with the with, uh, blossoming, if I can say it like that, of solid carbide milling cutters. Uh, it's small radial depths of cut, small axial depths of cut. The feeds are rather low, but the cutting speeds are at first sight extremely high. But on the other hand, if you, if you, if you think on, on yeah, compensation principles, and if you have an application where you say, okay, the depths of cut are small and the feeds are small. And on top of it, I use very positive milling cutters. Of course, you can increase your cutting speeds a lot. Nothing secret about that. It, it's just how you combine your cutting conditions. This, this, this thing has two, this approach has two main application domains. One application domain is uh, softer workpiece materials. I think on, on uh, aluminium applications is very typical. Uh, roughing in aluminium is very typical if, if, you, if you do the, the economic approach, which, which situation, which combination of cutting conditions gives you best economics. You find that in softer materials, think on, on aluminium again, that this is an interesting approach. And, and if you use this, you talk indeed about cutting conditions, cutting speeds, which are rather higher. We talk about two, three, four thousand meters per minute. Another very typical domain is where uh, cutting conditions due to the situation are limited uh, to small depths of cut and small feeds. Think on harder materials, finishing applications. To find productivity there anyway, there is always the possibility to use higher cutting speeds to compensate for the small depths of cuts and feeds. So, and there we talk about, uh, as an example, 100 meters per minute. Sometimes people ask me, give me a cutting speed for high speed machining. What defines high speed machining? But I can't give you a value. It depends on the application. In aluminium, it's 2000 meters per minute and more. In hard steel machining, it's 100 meters per minute and more. So careful here with, with classifying based on cutting speeds. It's very strongly depending on the, the, the situation. Uh, a, a bit of specific, a subdivision in the high speed machining is called hard milling. Hard milling is using high speed machining, high speed milling principles in hard materials. And there... Uh, our, our colleagues uh, in, in SECO, the, the, the Yarbro people, the solid carbide people, they did quite some intensive research years ago about how can I create an ideal situation of a cutting edge angle, uh, sorry, uh, a cutting engagement angle, to give me the possibility to maximize my productivity through high cutting speeds. And, and perhaps you have seen, uh, like, like I show you here, an example of a table where we say, okay, if you have a material of a certain hardness and if you select a radial depth of cut compared to the diameter of a milling cutter in, in line with, with what the table gives you as values, you have the possibility to apply high speed machining, which gives you the possibility to maximize the performance of a milling cutter and have uh, best possible production economy or milling or machining economy. You can do that also with uh, specific cutting materials. I give you here the example of uh, ceramic milling in high strength, high resistance, aerospace materials, 
the Inconel type of materials, where again, we, we, we apply the same principle. We say, okay, the material as such is defined as rather difficult to machine. How can I maximize now the combination of cutting conditions I use as such that the productivity, that the economy of the, of, of the application is maximized? Uh, high performance machining, high performance milling, very simple. You go for big depths of cut. Big depths of cut. And the, the other cutting conditions you determine in line with your starting point, I want to have big depths of cut. High performance machining, uh, it's big radial depths of cut, big axial depths of cut. You combine that with moderate feeds and medium cutting speeds. If you, if, you, if you walk that road, it's referred to as high performance milling. And we use the word performance here on purpose because if you can apply this, nothing beats high performance milling. But the poison is in the word if. Because to be able to use high performance milling, you need stable circumstances. You need a good milling machine. You need... Uh, good clamping systems for workpieces. You need a good fixturing system for your milling cutters. The, the workpiece shape as such must be stable. But if all of those conditions are there, high performance milling is the most economical approach, always. Uh, a good alternative for high performance milling is referred to as high feed milling. If the conditions are not as such that you can go for high performance due to lack of stability, due to the condition in which your milling machine is, due to the shape of a workpiece uh, that, that limits possibilities, that gives a limiting factor to stability, then you have to jump or then you can jump to an alternative of high performance milling, which is referred to as high feed milling. Come people sometimes refer to this as set level milling. Uh, small axial depths of cut, radial depths of cut can be rather high. You, you maximize your feeds. You are rather careful with cutting speeds, medium to high, but the axial depth of cut is rather small. That is referred to as high feed milling. Uh, micro milling. Some people, or sometimes in the literature, people refer to it as high RPM milling. Uh, I don't know which, which one is best, but if you talk about milling cutters with diameters, with dimensions which are extremely small, I, I, I think here in terms of a, a couple of tens of a millimeter, some millimeters, and you use those tools with, with rather small depths of cuts and, and things like that, uh, micro-machining, micro-milling, high RPM milling is that you, 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 you select your feet rather normal to low, of course, be careful. Uh, yeah, if you talk about this type of milling cutters, a normal feed is is sometimes a, a matter of microns, and you combine that with rather normal to high cutting speeds. The the real difficulty here is, if you have a milling cutter with a small diameter, and to reach a certain cutting speed, you need to make the milling cutter cut. You need a high RPM, and micro milling, I would say, is perhaps not. It, it's, it's not about the, the milling cutter itself. The, the big thing here is uh, the milling machine. Is a milling machine capable of handling high RPMs? Because to reach a certain cutting speed with a small diameter, you need a high RPM. And what you see here in the, in the animation, uh, you see two milling cutters. By sentiment, which one do you think has the the highest cutting speed, the one to the left or to the right, put, put, put it in comments. Uh, is the milling cutter to the right or is the milling cutter to the left having the highest cutting speed? Seeing if some things appear in comments. Because the correct answer here is both milling cutters are used with the same cutting speed. But the milling cutter to the Right, the diameter of that milling cutter is only half of the diameter of the milling cutter to the left. 
and the RPM of the milling cutter to the right is double of the RPM of the milling cutter to the left, making that both milling cutters are used with the same cutting speed. So if the diameter is small, ah, you need high RPM. That's, that's the challenge here. Um, a summary. First of all, I should uh, mention that there is one very important family I have not talked about, but this one is, is too important to be just a, a, a something in between. It's that so-called five-axis milling, um, where I have a machine that is capable of moving in five uh, directions at the same time. And the question is then, if I have that possibility, if I have a so-called five-axis milling machine, um, how am I going to select a milling cutter? How am I going to select cutting conditions? So the, the, every, everything works fine. How do I exploit to the maximum the possibilities of a five-axis milling machine? Uh, it's, it's about yeah, a bit like, like uh, what I said uh, last time. It's, it's a, yeah, a, a dilemma. How do I produce a workpiece in, in the best possible way, the most economical way? That's, that's the dilemma, and the solution is yeah, by using different strategies. Today, we focused on uh, technological strategies. Technological strategies is a group of strategies that are based on compensation principles, that are based on technological possibilities which are within a certain type of milling cutter. Technological strategies is about which milling cutter with which cutting conditions that do I want to select? And that is driving the approach. And, and uh, as I said, this, this movie illustrates perfectly. First of all, it, it, it illustrates, of course, uh, productivity, time needed to do the application. It does not really illustrate or gives us an idea about cost efficiency. That that's a dimension which which uh, yeah it, it's 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 a bit difficult to to show in a movie, but anyway I, I hope you can appreciate what we are confronted with by seeing, uh, yeah what what you see for the moment. Uh, it's about geometry, a bit of the same conclusion as the previous time. It's also a bit about yeah the tool and how to use the tool. And if you can combine the two, uh, yeah, then you are a champion. Eh? How to, to move the tool you selected and hopefully selected well and combine it with a set of cutting conditions so everything is, is to the maximum. That is uh, what we have been talking about today. And we focused on technology. We, we decided a bit that we say, okay, it's the technology that drives the discussion. The type of milling cutter I select, the type of cutting conditions I want to use that milling cutter with, and the tool part has to, to be as such that the conditions which I need to make it possible are fulfilled. That's the approach we, we use today. Uh, and I think now it's uh, time to see if there are some questions, and I'm pretty sure there, there, there are quite some questions. By the way, um, I would really appreciate if, if, if I find in the comments, in, in, in the chat here, uh, for later on, we can continue to talk a bit about this, discuss about this, that you share your experience with these things. Uh, did you did, did, Do you have experience with high feed, high speed, high RPM? Uh, and, and what is your experience? Good experience, bad experience? Uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's share these experiences. All together, we know much more than, than one individual person on, on its own, you know. Uh, uh, question. Ooh, ooh. A lot of questions, as I thought this, this, this thing all, always uh, brings questions. Uh, 
Ah, the, the first point is uh, very much appreciated. Finally, I have now the source where the, the movie I showed you can be found. So uh, I make sure I go, I, I contact uh, those people uh, again. And, and I, I uh, when I use the movie, I use, of course, the correct acknowledgements for it. Uh, then uh, I have a question. How to adjust the arrow setting of manual milling? Uh, sorry, but that's a question I do not really understand. The arrow setting of manual milling to one meter? Uh, that the, the person who put that question, can you please uh, yeah, clarify a little bit about what, what you mean there? I jump to the next question. Uh, how to avoid bent issue in tin wall uh, machining? Um, the, the thing here is, if you have to do tin wall milling, uh, what, you, what you must make sure is, you, you need to combine two things. Uh, first of all, you need to do a milling application. You need to, to select your cutting tool, your cutting conditions as such that radial cutting forces, radially to the milling cutter, are as, as, as little as possible. Because it's the radial cutting forces that will make that the wall is bending. The other thing we, we use here is that we want to keep the wall as thick as possible, as long as possible. So we kind of, in an artificial way, uh, don't remove all the material in the actual direction at once, but we work with little layers and we go down layer by layer keeping the wall as thick as possible, as long as possible, and at the same time combine that with the milling cutter selection and cutting condition selection so that the radial forces are minimized. That's, that's, that's the trick, kind of. Uh, the next question is, what is the main application area for plunge milling? Uh, my personal experience is plunge milling. Uh, you, you should see like, like this that if you do plunge milling, you do not have or uh, you do not have noticeable radial forces uh, coming from a milling cutter acting on a workpiece. So every application where that could be an issue that's an application where plunge milling uh, is, is a very interesting approach. Uh, that is from a workpiece perspective, from a milling cutter perspective. And, and we have been talking before about vibrations and so on. And, and perhaps some of you were when, uh, there when we discussed those things. We do have vibrations because we have radial forces acting on a milling cutter. And if that is combined with a milling cutter, which is... Uh, easily bent because it's long, because the diameter is small. With other words, I have a milling cutter with a high slenderness. But that is an application where plunge milling could be a very interesting approach. So slender milling cutters, long milling cutters combined with small diameters because the geometry of a workpiece demands for that. Is very typical uh, a situation where plunge milling, especially for roughing them, uh, could be an uh, interesting alternative. The other t thing relates to the workpiece, uh, where I have a situation that all the material, all the shape is, is, is a bit problematic. Well, plunge milling is going to give you lesser operational problems during, during the application than traditional radial milling. Uh, that's, uh, I would say that's two main indicators to decide to go for plunge milling. Uh, and the next question, of course, important dry or wet machining is critical for all processes. Uh, what do I suggest for cast iron machining? Uh, le let, me, let me say like this cast iron machining for the application itself, for the milling cutter itself, uh, cooling is, is 
not so important, but in cast iron machining, we use very often cooling for a quite different reason. And that is that uh, cast iron, the graphite in the material, if you machine it, the graphite is going to, 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 to come loose and be in the air which is for the operators, uh, which is for the machine tool, a not so favorable situation. For the operator, for health reasons. For the machine tool, for, for wear on the machine tool reasons. So in cast iron machining, we, we need to do something to keep the cast iron from being floating in the air. And that's why we use uh, cooling. So my, my answer is, is double. I would say cast iron machining always use cooling for the graphite thing. On the other hand, for the, the operational thing, for the, the, the cutting tool, for two life, it's not so important. Uh, then the question continues, the emulsion ratio is also critical. Of course, that has to do with the combination of, of uh, heat absorption, heat evacuation, and not being too aggressive for the machine tool. We, we need to find a good combination there. Uh, and then the third part in the question says uh, sometimes related to the condition of the casting it's too difficult yeah indeed because cast materials uh, you have the so called aging and aging is going to have a, a very big impact on machinability so the condition of the casting, the aging of the casting, the moment we do machining is very clearly going to influence to life of the milling cutter. Of course, a very important phenomenon. Uh, and the next question. What exactly is the reason for using the cyclic curve, trochoidal milling, I suppose you, you mean, or cycloidal milling? In case of high sp high speed machining, I suppose you mean. Bah! If you do slot milling, and if you think for your application you want to use high cutting speeds to maximize the economy, but slot milling, especially in the more difficult ma to machine materials, slot milling, difficult to machine material, and you want to use high cutting speeds, then you need to find a method to have small radial depths of cut. And small radial depths of cut, even in a slot, you can realize by giving a milling cutter that very typical movement. Each time you just, you, you go in contact a, a, a very little time and you remove, it's kind of, of peel milling in, in a slot. So that that is uh, yeah that's why we do it that that's uh, the main reason for it. Uh, I have to keep my eyes on the time also. The next question: high speed machining in hard materials, uh, feet and ship thickness recommendation was for which material? Uh, whatever material. If you want to do high speed machining in hard materials, you have to make sure that your feet and your, your chip thickness are, are small. Not too small, that's another question. Uh, and of course, which feet and which chip thickness will be different related to the type of uh, cutting material you use, as, as uh, said in the question, carbide, CBN, ceramic. But even more important, it's going to be influenced very seriously by the geometry of a cutting edge. I would say the geometry of a cutting edge is more important than the carbide grade in this case. Uh, the next question, what about balancing at high RPM? Uh, yeah, it's needed. Huh? That's, uh, that's uh, yeah. If you go for high RPM, the whole thing with centrif centripetal forces acting on a milling cutter uh, which are of, of lesser importance and which are lower at lower high uh, at lower RPMs. When you increase the RPM, you can end up in a situation where you need to do, uh, I would say, fine balancing. Because I think most milling cutters of today already standard as they come out of production, uh, with some corrections there where needed, are already rather rather well balanced. 
I don't dare to say because I already hear somebody asking the question to which RPM are they balanced off production good enough to 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 use directly because that is that is depending on the application that is depending on 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 a lot of things uh, but balancing goes hand in hand the need for balancing goes hand in hand with high rpm uh, uh, of, of course uh, the next question for which actual depth of cut do the tool catalogs usually specify the value of the feed rate and the cutting speed? That's a clever question. Uh, it should be mentioned, is my answer. If you find in a catalog, in a technical guide, uh, values for feeds and cutting speeds, it should be somewhere around the table. It should be stated for which conditions these values are given. And uh, again, this, this will be depending cutter by cutter. This, this depends quite a lot if, about the, the basic type of cutter. Uh, i give you an example. If you talk about a face milling cutter, standard we consider that a face milling cutter is used over 80% of its diameter, radial depth of cut. Normally it's stated with the tables, but if it's not, that's kind of, of, of customized. Uh, a square shoulder milling cutter, we think in terms of 30% in cut. So there are some, some specifications, but the correct answer is it should be mentioned at the table in which you find the feeds and the speeds. Here, however, you have the advantage of using uh, th things like, like suggest from SECO, where uh, automatically it's filled in for you. Automatically, if, if you specify your application, the, the system will say, okay, if you use a milling cutter with this radial depth of cut, this actual depth, and so on, and so on, this is the feed and this is the cutting speed. So you know it explicitly. The advantage of software like Suggest is, of course, also that if you, if you modify those things, that the system automatically will give you corrected feeds and speeds based on compensation principles. So it's... Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah it, it should come with the table you use. If you use software, it comes automatically. Uh, the next question, and yeah, I think that's the last question we can handle live here because I see the list is going on and on and on. But those questions... Uh, I come back later and, and uh, in, 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 the, in the chat, in the comment section, I try to give as many answers as possible. And perhaps we can even continue the discussion there further. But the last question, uh, within the time frame of today, what do you mean by very high RPM? Uh, yeah, that depends from from which perspective you ask the question. High RPM from from the machine tool perspective, or high RPM from the milling cutter perspective. High RPM from a milling cutter perspective is 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 yeah. See see the the typical cutting speed you should use the milling cutter with in the typical materials for which it is designed. If I, if I take a milling cutter which is uh, designed for, for machining hard steel, but a high RPM can be 1200 me, uh, RPM, 1200 rotations per minute. That's high RPM for the milling cutter. It depends on the cutting speed. If you take a milling cutter, which we designed for aluminium machining, high RPM can mean 6,000, 12,000, 15,000 RPM from a milling cutter perspective. From a machine tool perspective, the question is different because there you talk about the technology the machine tool builder used in the spindle concept. And some machine tool builders, yeah, they, they consider 6,000 RPM as high, and others talk about 60,000 RPM, and yet others talk about 600,000 RPM. So this is a, a bit of a, yeah, uh, different answers are possible here. But uh, I see we, we already uh, yeah, are a little bit over time. So the 
questions I could not answer, as I said. Uh, I go to the comment sections and uh, I try to answer as many as possible there. And that gives me only one last thing to do, and that is on behalf of my colleagues and myself to wish you uh, a good holiday season. Uh, that you can meet some friends and family and spend some nice time together. We already wish you all the best for next year, for the coming year. And of course, we hope to see you back at the next session, which we plan for uh, yeah, end of January, 23rd of January, where we are going to talk about milling cutter positioning. It's one of those words which is used all over, milling cutter positioning. But what exactly is that? And why is it so important? But that is for January. First, again, have a nice holiday season. Have nice meetings with friends and family. Enjoy the time of the year. Best wishes for next year. And looking forward to see you back in January. Bye-bye.